Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris McCoskey. I'm the communications manager out here at the town of Peel Island. I would like to welcome you to today's presentation with Jim Jordan. Uh, just a little bit uh, about Jim Jordan, and I'll go ahead and welcome him up. Uh, Jim has served as a wildlife biologist for the town of Kiwa Island since 2000. He is from Columbia, South Carolina, and received a bachelor's degree in biology from Furman University and a master's of science degree in wildlife ecology and, and management from the University of Georgia. Jim's work at Kiwa involves a nuanced wildlife management, invasive plant control, beach management, wildlife population surveys, community outreach like this, and wildlife research. He has conducted and or coordinated a variety of research projects on Kewa Island, focusing primarily on white-tailed deer ecology and fawn survival, bobcat ecology and habitat use, songbird migration and banding, and most recently, alligator uh, psychology and behavior. I would like to welcome Jim up to the stage. Appreciate that, thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you all for coming out uh, today. Uh, looking forward to kind of talking about bobcats and all the research we've done out here. Um, I've got some pretty, some pretty neat stuff. You know, I haven't done a presentation like this um, in person in quite some time. So, um, so it should be, hopefully it'll be pretty interesting. Um, obviously we've got a small group here today. So if you have questions during the presentation, just go ahead and ask them. Let's, we don't need to wait till the end. Um, just let me know and I'll answer them as we go. Um, so most of you prob probably live out here, so I probably don't need to tell you where Kiowa is. Um, but I do have this slide in there just in case there are folks that, that don't know. Obviously Kiowa is a barrier island uh, about 20 miles southwest of Charleston. Um, again, you're probably all aware it's a gated residential resort community. It's about 8,000 acres in total size. Um, about 5,000 of that is upland acres. Um, the rest is salt marsh and ponds. Five golf courses, um, close to 1,800 permanent residents. Uh, we have close to 3,400 developed lots, um, and a grand total of a little over 4,400 residential properties. Um, so, as Chris said, you know the town does and has for many years conducted wildlife research projects, um, and those tend to focus on two different groups of species. Um, and the first group of species that we tend to focus research on are keystone. Um, so they're, they typically sit at the top of the food chain. It's normally, you know, a, a predator or something further up in the food chain, um, but it can be something like white-tailed deer. They're just species that basically can impact the ecosystem in which they live. Uh, so bobcats do that by eating prey species and controlling their numbers. Um, deer do it by what they browse. So if they heavily browse oak saplings in a forest, then they can basically change the makeup of the habitat. The second species are indicator species. Um, and so these are typically used to monitor um, changes in the environment, um, to look at how effective management strategies are. Um, and they can also kind of let you know if there's a potential issue um, within the ecosystem, especially within a small part of the ecosystem. Um, so examples are migratory songbirds, uh, marsh sparrows, painted bunnies, and Wilson's clovers. But we're here to talk about bobcats. So let's, let's jump into that. Um, so bobcats are about twice the size of a domestic cat. Uh, males can be up to 68 pounds, but here at Kiwa, they're about 12, typically 12 to 20 to 28 pounds. Um, and our females here are 14 to 20 pounds. Um, they look a lot bigger than that, um, but when we have our hands on them and weigh them, you know, that's, that's what we come up with. Uh, they breed in the late winter, uh, February and April. Kittens are born two months later. They typically have one to three kittens per litter. Um, they're a solitary species, so they don't, they don't form groups or herds or anything like that. They're almost always by themselves, um, except for males and females during the breeding season. Um, and then once a female has, has kittens, those kittens will stay with her for about a year. Um, and then they go off on their own. Um, they're a visual predator, so they, they have very, very good eyesight. Uh, they don't have a great sense of smell. So they are mainly using their eyes to find their prey. Um, they eat a variety of things, but they tend to feed on rodents, rabbits, birds, and deer. So a little bit, a little bit more specific info on bobcats here on Kiowa. Um, historically, the island's been home to 30 to 35 bobcats. Uh, we know from doing uh, food habit surveys, uh, basically collecting bobcat scat, that they're primary prey out here. 
um, is rodents. So that's rats and mice and squirrels. Um, but during the spring, they tend to key in on deer fawns in particular. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and they do eat birds throughout the year, but that tends to peak during the winter months. Uh, the average home range size of the bobcat out here is around 1,500 acres for males um, and 800 acres for females. Um, they're an iconic species here on the island. Um, you know, kind of, kind of famous. Kiowa is kind of famous for its bobcats. Um, residents love them, and they help drive conservation efforts. So people want to help bobcats, um, and that drives them to make hopefully better decisions in what they do. Um, so I'm going to start with into the bobcat research and kind of go way back to when this all started. Um, so the very first bobcat research tracking study we did was in 2000. Uh, we were using DHF collars. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how those work, um, different than what we're using now with GPS collars. Um, so in that first study, we captured 12 bobcats. Uh, we repeated the study in 2004 and 2005. Uh, we caught 16 bobcats, but at that, at that time, we had a lot of great foxes on the island. So we included them in the study as well. Uh, we put collars on five great foxes. Um, and during each of these studies, uh, we tracked these animals for about a year, um, and we were looking to figure out you know, how do they move around the island, what size you know, of an area do they live in, where are they having their kittens, um, and all of that good stuff. So VHF radio telemetry, um, effectively the, the radio collar is emitting a, a pulse or a beep on a specific radio frequency um, that we can pick up with our, our receiver and antenna here. And so to get a single location for one bobcat, we have to go out into the field, um, obviously at all hours of the day and night. Um, and basically we would go to the first location after we heard the beep and get a pretty good estimate on the bearing to where that animal was. And we do that twice, or two additional times. Um, and effectively where those three bearings came pretty close together, that's where we thought the bobcat was. Um, you know, not very precise locations, but you know, it, it was it was all it was all that was available back then. Um, it still gave us some good data. Um, in 2007, we started our GPS study. Um, things got to get a lot easier with GPS. Um, obviously, GPS can get a location within about 10 meters, um, so it doesn't require us to be out in the field at all hours of the night trying to guess where the bobcat was. Um, so we've been doing that every year since then. Uh, we typically trap in January, January through March. Um, and so far we've, we've collared 99 bobcats, 55 females and 44 males. Um, and so, you know, as I said, these collars are collecting locations. Uh, we set a schedule for them, you know, say, the, right now our collars collect one location every four hours, so we get six locations a day for our bobcats. Um, and then again, we, can, we analyze that data. And we'll look at a lot of that data um, and kind of what we do um, but first, just real briefly, you know, how, how do we catch a bobcat? Um, so we use a, a cage trap. Uh, we use a live man rooster in the back of it. Um, they're in a separate enclosure, so they're safe, safe from bobcats back here. Um, and then once they're in the trap, we will sedate them with a with a sedative, and then we'll of course, you know, lay a major sex them, and then we'll put put the radio collar, the GPS collar on. Uh, we'll put them back in the trap. Um, and then once they kind of wake up from the sedative, we'll come back a few hours later um, and let them go. So here's one of our cats coming out of the trap. I've tried that about 150 times with my iPhone. And it's worked like three times. So that, was, that was one of the three. So a little bit about habitat use. So obviously we've collected, you know, I don't know if I mentioned it, but close to 200,000 individual locations for bobcats on Kiwa. Um, so what do we do with all those points? Um, well, one thing we can do is look at what types of habitat they spend their time in. Um, and what we, what we did in this analysis was we looked at where they were during the day and where they were at night. Um, so as you can see here, um, scrub shrub habitat, which is effectively, um, Low growing vegetation, typically less than 15 feet tall, um, typically wax myrtles, yopons. Um, on Kiowa, it's found primarily in the secondary dunes and along the marsh edge. So, low scrubby habitat, 
you know, obviously it's very dense and it's a great place for bobcats to hide during the day. Um, they also spend some, a good bit of time in forested habitat as well. Um, and then when you look at nighttime points, you know, again, they're still utilizing scrub shrub um, and forest, but they start to use developed areas at a pretty significant level during the nighttime hours. Um, and then roadways as well, kind of surprisingly pops up at nighttime. Um, and, and what that is, obviously these animals are not walking right down the middle of the paved road, um, but they're using the road easements, you know, which on you are typically pretty heavily vegetated. Um, so they travel road corridors, and we'll look at some, some detailed maps of that here in just a minute. Um, and then obviously they're comfortable coming into backyards um, and developments at night. Um, that's where a lot of food is, and so they take advantage of that. All right, so let's look at a little bit of data. So this is from female bobcat 118. Um, just to kind of orient you where you are, this is the V gate up here. Um, so this is governors and surf song looping around here, flyway going, going this way. Um, so the blue line is the home range of this female bobcat. Um, so she pretty much lived her entire life in that one, one area. Um, and so first we'll look at look at her daytime points. Um, so kind of no surprise what I showed you on that on that table just a minute ago. You know, during the day this cat is almost always in the secondary view. Um, and we'll actually zoom in and look at that a little bit closer. Um, here's a good good concentration here. Um, so again you've got obviously homes here along the beach front and then you've got red indicates structure of habitat. So you've got this scrubby dune habitat. And this cat is pretty much spending most days um, in that habitat, um, often underneath boardwalks. Um, she seemed to like to go underneath this deck right here a good bit. Um, so taking advantage of, of the good quality habitat we had. And so back to daytime points, and then I'm going to throw nighttime points up here now. So uh, yes, huh? You said she's under a boardwalk, so I'm assuming that's a boardwalk from someone's house. Correct. Do you look at all whether or not those are people who are year-round residents or if they're just vacation? Do you know what I mean? Because right, sure. That's a lot of time under if somebody's there all the time. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem to bother. I mean, it's not something I've specifically looked at. Um, but yeah, they're they're quite at home under boardwalks, and you know, we we walk by, by them all the time when we're tracking them, and they you know, they just stay in cover. As long as they've got good cover, they don't. It doesn't bother them that people walk, walk pretty close. Um, so nighttime points, um, obviously now she's taking advantage of all of her home range, right? All the different habitat types out, out there. Um, and we'll look at, so in, in this map here, this is 24 hours in the life of this bobcat. Um, so kind of what she does on a typical night. Um, and so we'll start here at sundown. Um, so this is around, let's see, around 7, 10 at night. Um, she was actually in, in the dunes during the day, but in the evening she crossed her song. Um, and then she looped her way all the way up to Erie Hall. Um, spent a good bit of time up there, probably caught something in the yard up on Erie Hall. Um, and then she did a big loop all the way down Governor's, um, walked across the golf course bridge here. And then enough across another leisure trail bridge here. Um, came back to about the same location around 5, 5.30 in the morning. Um, so, so pretty neat, you know, obviously, you know, to have this sort of insight into what a bobcat's doing, it's, it, it, always, it never ceases to amaze me. Um, so I got a few more for you. So here's, here's one that's a little bit different. Um, so this is an adult male um, that has a really big home range. So obviously this is Kiowa over here, this is Seabrook, um, and now we're up here on John's Island. And there's, there's the roundabout right there. Um, so in this example, we're going to look at a week in the life of this podcast. Okay, so day one, uh, this cat starts, I think it started on Seabrook, yeah. So day one, it's on the very southern end of Seabrook, uh, travels all the way up through the sea, across the roundabout, all the way up uh, to, to just, just, just to the right of uh, Betsy Pearson Parkway, uh, actually back in Mullet Hall Plantation, uh, which is now Key Waterford. Um, and, 
so spent the day up there. There's some really good quality bobcat habitat up there. At least there was uh, when this bobcat was up there. Um, and then day three, uh, back across the roundabout over the Kiowa River Bridge um, and back to Kiowa. Day four is a Kiowa day. Um, just a quick, a quick jaunt around the island. Um, day five, uh, went out to Captain Sam's for just a little bit and then back across the bridge and all the way back to the southern end of Sea River again. Um, so this cat is, and this is probably breeding movements. So this cat is, is an adult male. Uh, this is during the breeding season. Um, so he's basically visiting three different areas of really good bobcat habitat. So the western end of Kiowa, the southern end of, of Seabrook, and then this part of the Kiowa River up here. Um, day six, back to Kiowa. Uh, day seven, back across the bridge again, starts for Seabrook and decides he wants to go to John Bow. So ended up uh, back there again. So, I mean, this is not typical movement behavior for bobcats. Um, but pretty neat and obviously, you know, we, we know they walk across the bridge all the time at night, but obviously this showed you that, you know, in the span of a week, this cat walked across the Kiwa River Bridge at least three or four times. Um, so here's another one that's, that's a little bit interesting. So this is, so normally when we see kind of strange movement or large movements, it's always with juvenile or adult males, uh, normally with our young males. Um, this is the only example we have of a female making a really big so we don't know exactly what was going on with this female. Um, my guess is that we happened to catch her for some reason during the breeding season, making a pretty big movement to Kiowa. That's when we caught her, um, because pretty much within two weeks of us catching her, she went to Seabrook, um, and she spent a good bit of time there. Um, and then as it came close to time for her to give birth, so you know, when she would typically establish her den, um, she left Seabrook. Uh, traveled all the way up Bohica Creek um, and then swam Bohica Creek, went to Wadden Walk in April, um, and then went all the way out to the far end of Bears Bluff Road or Wadden Walk, um, where there's a large undeveloped property there with really good bobcat habitat. Um, and she had it in there and raised kids down there. Um, so we don't know what she did after that because her collar quit working, um, but really, really need to see, and obviously, again, you know, something you could never hope to, to learn about an animal unless you've got a, got a collar on it. Um, so here's one from 2015. So this actually just shows each color is a different bobcat. Um, so these are all of our 2015 bobcats. And so this year we had quite a bit of off-island movement. Um, you know, every year we, we do have a cat, at least one that goes to at least Seabrook, um, occasionally John's Island. Um, it's not typical for them to go further than that, but um, and this year we had a couple that did. Um, and one in particular I thought was, was pretty fascinating. So this is an adult male. Um, so obviously the red outline is Kiwa, this is Seabrook. Um, this is the North Edisto River, which is about half to three quarters of a mile wide, um, really wide down here at the ocean. Um, and then this is Edisto Island, um, and Edisto Beach way, way down here. Um, so this cat went back and forth across the North Edisto um, three different times. Um, and spent a good bit of time on Edisto before ultimately coming back to Seabrook. Did you have one of the scans on our Yeah, we might get a zoom in and see that a little better. I mean, the dates are on there. I just thought he I think that, I think she left, he left in July and spent, looks like a lot of points in October over there. Maybe went in July and they came back and went again in the fall. Um, so two different trips to Edisto. Um, and then this one might be my favorite. So this is uh, from 2018. This is an adult male, um, 750. And so he, we caught him on Kiowa in February. Um, spent most of his time out by Captain Sam Spit um, until just after July 4th. So I don't know if he didn't like the fireworks or the crowds or what, but on July 6th, he left Kiowa um, on a mission and traveled up, up Bohicket, um, pretty much followed the river up for a while and then ended up um, just south of the Limehouse Bridge, um, right at the intercoastal waterway. And as I was looking at these points, I was like, well, there's no way he's gonna swim in the intercoastal waterway. 
probably not going to happen. Well, we did um, <laughs> a lot of times. Um, so, so it's kind of hard to see, but effectively, this is Main Road coming up. The bridge over the intercoastal is right here, um, and so this cap went back and forth, swam the intercoastal waterway at least 16 times in the span of three months. <clears throat> and also crossed Highway 17 at least 15 or 16 times. Um, and so this is, for those of you who are familiar with this part of Charleston, I'm sure you are, this is Beach Ferry Road. Uh, so the Walmart is right about here. Um, and my house is actually right there. So I don't know if this cat was trying to come home and see me or what, but we got <laughs> incredibly close to my house. Um, but spent a good bit of time up there and stayed up there until, until the car ran out of battery. Um, all right, so there was some of the kind of cool stuff with, with you know, large scale movements. Um, so I'm just gonna talk briefly about, you know, the other way you can utilize this data. So I mentioned that we figure out how big of a home, home range they have, what size area do they live in. Um, and so here's an example from an adult male. Um, so his home range is 1,700 acres. And then another thing we do is we, we calculate what's called a 25% home range or his core home range. And so that's basically the, the habitat within his home range that's the most important. Um, and so obviously a lot of those are down along the beach um, where you've got good scrub shrub habitat. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit, a little bit more later, kind of how we take this, this data and go a little further with it. Um, but here's just another close up of these, these areas where he spends a lot of time Typically, those are daytime hiding places. Um, so another thing we get from GPS, from having GPS collars on bobcats, is we can find dens. Uh, we found a lot of dens over the years, um, and so kind of some take homes from from that is that you know typically these dens are in larger patches of cover. Um, they don't like to be around people when they're raising their kittens. Um, they don't create a den. Um, they don't dig. They take advantage of what's out there. Got a little video here of a, of a den site, which I'll which I'll play as I'm. Uh, oh, we'll let it play here. So, so this is actually right off of Beach Walker Drive. Um, so she's got two kittens um, underneath this little little hollow hollowed out stump. And so she let us get really close. I mean, I'm about eight feet away from her at this point, um, and she actually wouldn't leave. Normally they leave, you know, often we don't even see them leave the den site when we approach, um, but she refused to leave. And so we came back another day and she wasn't there and so we were able to tag, tag the kittens and put, put them right back in the den. Um, so yeah, th this one was along Beach Walker Drive, actually in the area about where the, where the Timbers is now. Um, and so they tend to take advantage again of undeveloped areas, secondary dunes or edges of marsh, just like where they, you know, where they like to hide out during the day. There's great cover and there's food right there. Um, we have learned that the female does move to the inside quite a bit. Um, she'll do it typically a couple times in the first two months. Uh, so here are all the dens that we found over the years. So this goes all the way back to, to 2000. Um, I think we found close to 45 bobcat dens. And so, you know, a couple areas that I've highlighted here with red circles or, you know, just areas where they're historically, historically have been dens and are really critical den, den habitat. Um, one is Captain Sam Spit, and that's probably the, the best quality bobcat habitat we have in the um, uh, We've got an area here along Flyway Drive near Royal Beach, um, kind of the Ocean Palms area. Um, that's historically been a highly preferred dining site. And then the last one, and this one has been used extensively the last four or five years. Um, so this is the area of property that's between Ocean Course Drive um, and the golf course. So kind of in the 20 to 25 Ocean Course Drive area. Um, but behind those homes, there's an undeveloped strip of property. Um, some of it's owned by the Conservancy. Um, it's actually fairly heavily pruned at times to keep a new window for the houses on the ocean course all the way to the ocean, um, which actually helps make it really good bobcat habitat. A lot of times you think that, you know, if, you, if we keep our hands off and we don't do anything, the habitat is better, um, but 
uh, you know, by by coming in and pruning, they're they're keeping the understory dense. Um, you know, a lot of fallen trees for bobcats to hide under, and for rats and mice to hide under too. So. Um, is the Kiowa River down here? Uh, Kiowa River's here. Yeah, where does it start off the ocean? Uh, here. Yeah. So yeah, so that's Captain Sam's right there. Yeah, okay. Jim, yes. did, did you find any um, dens in that ocean forest area this year? Because we I did yes. a turtle patrol there. We did. And we could see um, uh, it looked like a mom and a, and a baby bobcat yes. or something. We we had a den in that patch it was last year and this year. Uh, the same the same female. She been within about 50 yards of where she's been last year. Okay, so moving on to continuing to talk about how we utilize this data. So how do we kind of pull it all together uh, and disperse it to the community? Uh, and we do that through a document called Bob the Bobcat Management Guidelines. Uh, we got our first draft in 2008. Um, we're due to redo it here pretty soon. Um, but effectively, the, the concept is to to try to maintain good high quality bobcat habitat across the island. Um, so we set up five management units. They're basically about the size of a home range of bobcat. Um, and then we look further within those areas. Um, again, we look, utilize our home range data, our denning data, you know, daytime points to basically further identify really small patches of cover that are critical for bobcats. Um, we call those IBAs. Um, so in yellow, you can see all of the IBAs. Um, you know, no surprise, most of the IBAs are along the ocean front and along the marsh edge. Um, again, that's where our best bobcat habitat seems to be. Um, and so working with Conservancy and other entities, you know, we started looking at all these areas and seeing what we could do to protect them, preserve them, enhance them. Um, in some cases, some of these IBAs, um, you know, there's a few examples up along the northern marsh area of Kiwa where they're literally just in three or four people's backyards on the marsh. And so in those situations, um, it's simply a matter of educating the homeowners that, hey, you've got great bobcat habitat right here. Just you know, be extra careful um, in protecting that area. All right, so I'm gonna now summarize um, kind of the big picture of what we've learned from all of this GPS data work. Um, most of it I've probably already touched on. You know, bobcats spend most of their time during daylight hours in thick patches of cover. They don't move a whole lot during the day. Uh, typically, they're in scrub shrub habitat at that time. Um, and that's typically, again, along the marsh edge and in the secondary dunes. Uh, and then they travel through and, and forage in developed areas, um, travel along road corridors at night. Um, they do avoid golf courses. We almost, we rarely get a GPS point on a golf course. Uh, no surprise, there's no cover and no food on a, on a golf course. So they'll move across them really quickly, but they don't spend any time there. Is that something that we can also evaluate? Hmm? Is maybe that also a food cost allocator? That they're avoiding golf courses? Mm -hmm. I don't think no. so. I mean, it's it, it's mainly just that there's really no reason for them to spend yeah. any time there. Um, so, I, so I know you're all aware that, you know, the recent issues we've had with Bobcats, it's almost been a little bit of time talking about that. Um, you know, obviously, we've been doing this GPS work for a long time, so we've got a really good handle on bobcat numbers. Um, and we started to notice a decline around 2017. Um, the survival rate of our collared animals, um, the annual survival rate, so if we catch a bobcat in February, um, the percent chance of that animal surviving until the following year. Um, for, for one year, that's the annual survival rate. Um, so historically, even going all the way back to the 2000 and 2004 studies, annual survival is greater than 90 percent. Um, so almost all of our bobcats that we caught made it for an entire year. Um, that dropped as low as 25 percent. Um, and so we knew something was going on. Um, reproduction dropped substantially, so our females, the few that we did have collars, weren't having kittens or there were issues um, with them having kittens. So, um, and then the other thing we noticed was that our deer numbers went through the roof. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, we've done, a, as I mentioned, a lot of different research projects over the years. Um, and one that we did, oh, I guess it's almost been 20 years ago, uh, but we did a fall mortality study. Um, and so 
what we wanted to figure out at that point was, well, how, you know, we knew bobcats were important, we knew they were eating deer fawns, but we didn't know to what extent they were, they were eating deer fawns and the impact that they were having on the fossils, on the deer population. And so we did a four-year study where we caught fawns literally the day they were born. Uh, we put little tiny radio collars on them. Uh, these collars would expand as they, as they grew and then ultimately fall off. Um, so we, we tracked 124 fawns. Um, and bobcats killed 56% of them in the first two weeks primarily. Um, so obviously that's a huge impact on the deer population. Um, to lose more than 50% 50, 50 of fawns every year. Um, and so no surprise, our deer population remained really, really stable. Um, a slight, slight uptick over the years um, until 2017 when we started seeing the other issues. Obviously this just kind of reconfirmed that there was something something going on. Um, and so our numbers went from 71 deer per square mile up to 123 in the span of three years, so almost double. Um, and so we actually had to do the first ever deer harvest out here, um, which seems to have helped to stabilize numbers. We don't have our 2022 deer numbers yet. Um, we'll do that survey next, next week. Um, and so we'll see, but um, the hope is that numbers will come down and then the further hope is that bobcat numbers, which we'll talk about some of the positive signs there, that bobcat numbers are rebounding and you know, they can once again, once again continue to you know, do what they do to control their numbers. Um, so you all know why we, we started losing bobcats, I'm sure. Uh, but if you don't, I'm gonna talk about it real quick. Um, so what we figured out was that we, we, a lot of the issues are the primary reason that we were seeing a low survival rate in our bobcats um, was because of the impact of anti-glide and other insects. Um, so these are a type of pesticide um, used to control rats and mice. Um, there are two different types of anti-coagulants. Uh, first generation products um, have been around for a long, long, long time. Um, they're multiple feed baits, so a rat or mouse has to go in there and eat it several times over the span of a week or two before it gets a lethal dose. Um, they have much lower secondary toxicity, um, that, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a minute. Um, these three compounds are rarely used anymore. Um, in the 1970s, rats right, and mice started becoming resistant to the first generation anticoagulants, and so the industry developed second generation anticoagulants. So they work the same way, um, but they're single dose. Um, so, so if a rat or mouse goes in there and eats just a little bit, that'll be enough to kill them. Um, so obviously they're much, much, much more toxic. Um, and so the four um, second generation anticoagulants are protopacadum, bromodiolone, dipenicum, and dipenicum. And we'll talk a little bit about how they, how they work. Um, so they're, they're, as I mentioned, they're lethal to rodents from a single feeding um, and are many times more toxic than the first generation products. Um, another big issue with them is that it takes three to seven days for a rat or mouse that eats the lethal dose to die. Um, so during that three to seven day period, they tend to continue to eat bait. Um, so if they continue to do that at the end of the week, you know, they've probably got a level that's many, many, many times the lethal level. Um, and then obviously if a hawk or owl or bobcat eats that rat or mouse, then they're basically getting all of that all of that poison directly into them, which they start to accumulate as well. Um, so these products take a very, very, very long time to break to break down within the body. It can take a year or more. Um, so obviously if, if an animal continues to feed on the bait directly um, or is eating rats or mice that has been impacted, um, it builds up over time faster than it can break down and ultimately you get to, to lethal levels. Yeah, the, the, the issue with SGAs is well known. Um, it's well studied worldwide. Um, tend, most of the studies tend to focus on large predators and birds of prey. Birds of prey are particularly impacted um, by these compounds. Um, there's been very, very little research in the Southeast and no research in South Carolina on these products and their impacts on wildlife um, until now. So what we're learning is, is new for the state. I mean, it's not unexpected. Uh, but no one's documented it. So the direct impacts from these compounds on bobcats, so this is direct deaths from lethal levels of these compounds. Uh, 
the first one was an adult female in August of 2019. Um, so this was a collared animal that we knew had died. Um, we went and picked her up and then had sent her to a lab for a full necropsy and they determined that she effectively bled to death, um, which is the way that these anticoagulants work. They effectively um, interfere with the absor absorption of vitamin K. Um, and so they basically an animal that, that gets a lethal dose effectively dies from, from bleeding to death because they can't clot it blood. Um, so that's what happened to this female. Uh, we had another male uh, the next year that we were able to get tested as well, same, same cause of death. And then the most traumatic one and the one that really got, you know, got a lot of media attention, um, local attention, and uh, really motivated the community was, was in June of 2020 um, when we had an adult female who was in the process of, of giving birth at her den site, um, and she she bled to death, um, and obviously her, her kid passed as well. So um, pretty traumatic, right? We lost five 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 bobcats um, one day, um, and so you know, we knew there was a huge problem and we could do something about it. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about what we did um, and kind of where we are, but. Um, you know, once we had an idea this was going on, uh, we wanted to see you know, how big the problem was. Um, we knew it was impacting Bobcat, but we didn't know how it was impacting other animals. Uh, so we started testing every animal we could. Um, every animal we picked up off the roadside, dead in the yard, uh, we would take a sample and send it to the lab. So since February of 2020, we've tested 116 animals. 64% of those have shown exposure to SGAs. Um, I basically listed them by the percent that showed exposure. Um, so all of our bobcats were exposed. Um, all of our birds of prey uh, that we've been able to test were exposed as well. We've tested three alligators, they showed exposure. Um, a coyote, a roof rat, and then 77% of possums and 50% of raccoons. Um, and so bobcats certainly eat possums and raccoons, so that's another way you know, that they're getting more, more of these products um, into their systems. Um, and this is just, you know, another way that we look at these testing data um, is to try to see if we can figure out hot spots across the island where these animals are picking, picking up these compounds. And so we're using raccoons and possums uh, because they have pretty small home ranges. Um, so we know that if, a, you know, if we pick up a raccoon you know, on oyster rake, that it probably consumed that poison bait somewhere on oyster rake or the nearby area. Um, obviously, with a bobcat or a bird of prey, you know, a bobcat can have a home range of 1,500 acres. Um, we had no idea where he, you know, where that bobcat could have picked that poison up. And then birds of prey are even tougher because they, they can fly, and so they often end up on Seabrookers, Johns Island, or downtown Charleston, you know, or the ground. So. The hope is that we continue to monitor raccoons and possums over time, um, and again, try to look at, at areas where we're getting higher levels of these, of these compounds. And so, in this map here, basically larger circles indicate a, a larger exposure level. Um, and so it kind of helps us hopefully track this over time. Um, so, so this is a little bit of positive news here. So this is, um, showing the average exposure level within tested animals by year. Um, so with our bobcats, um, in 2020, the average exposure level um, was 1,400 parts per billion. <coughs> and then it dropped by half to 2021 and it stayed about that level in 2022. With our raccoons, we're seeing that same that same down, down, downward trend, uh, which is good. Possums don't track quite as well, um, but it's partly due because in 2020, we actually only had four possums, so it's a very small sample size. Um, but certainly we're seeing a decline between 2021 and 2022. All right, so, so kind of to back it up to, and some of you may, may know the, the history of this and what we've tried to do but once we knew there was an issue with these products, our first, my first thought was, well, I'll just write an ordinance, town council will pass it, we'll ban the use of them and problem solve. So we did that, I wrote an ordinance, 
the day it was going to go to council, we received a letter from the State Department of Pesticide Regulation telling us that we were not, we, we did not have the legal authority to regulate pesticides. Uh, sole regulatory authority for pesticides rests at the federal level and then at the state level. Um, and so we, we could not do that. Um, so we tried a number of other avenues with the state agency to try to get some sort of temporary moratorium in place. That didn't work. And so then we said, okay, well, we just have to do it ourselves. Um, and we can't legislate it, so let's just you know, come up with a program to voluntarily stop using these products. Um, and that was our Bobcat Guardian program, uh, which we unveiled, I think, in August of 2020. Um, so we're two years into that now. Um, obviously, all of the positive trends we're seeing are directly attributable to this program. Um, you know, it was it was embraced very quickly, you know, not, not just by residents, but by pest control companies, the island entities and businesses as well. Um, so, you know, the, the last time I looked, we had 29 pest management companies signed up not to use an SGA, never to use an SGA, uh, 20 businesses and, and island entities, and then 655 resident properties. How many, like a, how many pest control companies are it's a good question. Um, something we looked at very early on, we, we looked at business licenses for pest control companies. Um, and as near as we can tell, there are around 50 companies um, with a business license. But um, some of those may not mess, some of those probably don't provide rodent control services out here. Um, because pest control includes you know, termites and insects and everything. So it's not necessarily we have 50 rodent control. But certainly we have, you know, there, there are a handful of companies that have the largest footprint out here. Um, some companies that service close to 1,500 residential properties. Um, and so all of the big ones um, have taken the pledge. So um, you know, there may be some that, that haven't, that are still using it, but hopefully not on a large scale. Yes, sir. If they've taken the pledge, yeah, you can go to uh, to savequabobcats.com, um, and we've got it all listed right there. Um, you know, we're in the process of of asking folks to repledge again. Um, you know, we don't want people to forget. You know, and properties change hands, businesses change hands. So it's you know, this program has been hugely successful, but it's only going to continue to work if we stay vigilant and continue to, to follow it. Yes. Is the 650 gone? Oh, probably half. Um, I think we have. No, actually. Now, I think if you if you count multi-unit, we have close to 4,000 residential properties, residential units. Um, but it's a little bit deceiving because, for example, in businesses and entities, um, it includes some regimes. Um, so a regime might represent. You know, a regime with a multi-unit development might be 100, you know, 100 or more units, um, and then you know, with residential properties, a number of our businesses are, you know, they provide property management services, so they're servicing a lot of properties as well. And so when they've taken the pledge, obviously all the homes that they work on are not using these products. And is it possible to find out what management companies have taken that pledge? Yeah, it's all on the same you all out. Yeah, it's all up there and, and all the homeowners as well. To, to, to this point though, are there any businesses or residents that are just saying, no, I'm not gonna follow this? I mean, is there any, any pushback on this? Um, so, some, but not, not much. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was some initially from the pest control companies. Um, and then I think that there was, the pest control companies quickly figured out that they needed to make a change because you know, homeowners were, were effectively firing pest control companies that weren't taking the pledge. And so they, you know, they were financially motivated to get on board really quick and then you know, use that to market themselves, which would seem to me it would work for everyone. Um, so it was more about awareness, don't you think? And even now, do you, do you believe that? I, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think that any of the pest control companies, homeowners, businesses, it, no one was in, intentionally trying to harm bobcats and birds of prey. They just didn't know. But now we know. And so, um, yeah, we just gotta, gotta, we just have to stay vigilant going forward. Yeah. 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 Y
Um, so, so the next couple of slides, I'm going to go through these pretty quick. Um, so, actually, let me let me back it up. So, so during all of this, right, we've got our voluntary program going on. Uh, we're still having conversations with the Department of Pesticide Regulation, seeing if there's some something they can do to help us. Um, and so, what kind of came out of all that discussion is, well, let's fund a research project to look at this issue in a little more detail. Um, and you know, pr produce some 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 good data with, with hard facts, um, you know, that can be published and available to everyone. And so, um, after months and months of discussion, uh, we, we developed a a study. Um, it's a four-year PhD study. Um, funding for that, almost 20% of the funding comes from the Department of Pesticide Regulation. So. You know, while they didn't do anything legislatively, they are contributing to, to learn more about the issue. Um, so, so just real quick, I'll run through the, the primary objectives of this study. Um, this study is underway now. The graduate student Megan Keating started last winter. Um, and she's got three years of field work. Um, and so we should see her final product in 2025. Um, but certainly we'll get data along the way. Um, so the primary objective is you know a lot of this is to continue the research we're doing we were already doing but to expand it a little bit um, to continue to monitor sga concentrations of podcasts um, and continue to look at their behavior and survival uh, number two and this this is the one i'm really excited about um, to, to basically go back with all of my data my 200,000 points and all of this data that i either don't have the time to analyze or the technical know-how to analyze the data the way they can these days with models and all kinds of stuff. So uh, Megan's going to do all that for me. So um, basically go back and look at all of my data, um, come up with population estimates over time, as well as forecast potential future, basically the ideal population size for Bobcats here. Um, so that's going to be great. Uh, objective three is to look at patterns in Bobcat diet. Uh, the hope here is that we can figure out which prey species are contributing to, to how they're picking up these SGAs. Um, you know, back when I did a SCAP study um, for my graduate work in 1998, um, it involved me taking these back to the University of Georgia. Um, they gave me an oven because you've got to dry these before you can analyze them. Um, it smelled really bad, they made me put it on the roof of the graduate building. <laughs> Um, and so I would take these cats up there, I'd bring them down once they were dried, and then I'd go through them by hand under a microscope, um, identifying, identifying the hair um, and bones and figuring out you know, what species they were eating. Um, nowadays, you just send it to a lab, and they can do a genetic analysis of the scat and tell you every prey species in there. Um, we have a lot of these here. Um, but they can also tell you the, the genetic, well, they can tell you which bobcat deposited the scat. So they can genetically figure out which bobcat. And so over time, you can look at the scats and the, you know, the prey selection of an individual bobcat over time, um, which, is, which will be really cool. And then the other thing you can do with scat is you can analyze it for the presence of SGAs. Um, so when, when any animal is breaking down or, or these, these compounds are leaving the body, it's mostly through the scat. Um, and so the hope is that we can, we can analyze that as well. That as well. Um, objective four is to continue looking at raccoons and possums and other other species, um, you know, other than bobcats for the next three years. And then the the fifth objective is to look at rodents, um, species abundance across the island and distribution. Again, just just trying to gather more data to better understand uh, the issue and how these compounds are moving out the food chain. Uh, just real quick, the expected outcomes and benefits from this study uh, to understand the impacts of rodenticides on bobcats and other wildlife mortality, uh, develop best practices for rodent control and developments with minimal impact on wildlife and the environment, uh, sustain populations of bobcats and other wildlife and developments, effective reduction of rodent populations, and then to serve as a model for the healthy coexistence of people and wildlife in developed areas. Uh, I mentioned most of our project partners. Um, you know, we we have funding from from the town, obviously from Clemson, um, 
uh, the Coastal Department of Pesticide Regulation, uh, the QR Conservancy, and the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Um, so it's a good group of project partners. Um, and just to touch real quick on, you know, kind of come back to the, the positive trends that I've talked about. Um, you know, we are seeing numbers, you know, certainly the, the numbers, bobcat numbers have not continued to decline. They stabilized and now started to increase. I talked earlier about survival rates. Um, in 2019, we had 33%, 25% in 2020, which is when we kicked off the Guardian program. In 2021, our annual survival jumped to 83%. Um, and in 2022, all of our cats are alive so far. Um, and so we're almost at the end of the year. So pretty, pretty amazing change in the span of two, two or three years. Um, kitten production is increasing again. Uh, we're seeing lower concentrations of SGAs in the animals that we test. We talked about that. Um, how you can help. There's a number of different things you can do. Obviously, you know, it still remains important to preserve and protect bobcat habitat across the island. You know, we know where that, that good habitat is. Uh, Marshhead is dunes. Um, bobcat management guidelines are a great tool or a great source to go to to understand this a little better. <coughs> Controlling invasive species that may impact these good areas of bobcat habitat. Uh, the second is to create new bobcat. You know, that's kind of one reason we created our Grow Native program, um, which is another town program um, to push the use of native plants, dense understory, um, all of that is good bobcat habitat, and good painted bunny habitat, and lots and lots of things. Um, if you do your own rodent control, practice integrated pest management. Um, the first step is not to use a rodenticide. Uh, number one, you figure out if you actually have a problem. Seeing a couple rats run across your back deck is not, not a rodent problem. Uh, we have lots of native rats and mice uh, that don't cause a problem. They don't get inside homes, um, but they do scurry around in yards and on porches. Um, so if you have an issue with, you know, typically the issue, the rodent species that we have issues with out here is the roof rat. It's a non-native species, uh, has a really long tail, is great at climbing trees and can jump, um, often gets into attics and inside homes. That's the species that causes the most problems. Um, so if you have roof rats getting in your house, well, you do have a problem. Um, and so the first step is to, to do something about it, obviously. Um, you can just have your home sealed up, which is a great first step. Um, you know, there can be roof rats around your house, but if they can't get in your house, um, then you really don't have an issue. Um, you can use traps. And then if the issue can't be resolved that way, you can use rodenticides. Um, there are a number of alternatives out there that are just as effective and are not SGAs. Um, so there's never a reason to use an SGA. Um, and again, you can find all of that at safeqlbobcats.com. Um, it lists the, the SGAs and then also alternatives that are effective. Um, and obviously, we want everyone to be a bobcat program. Uh, it's a great program, it's worked great, um, and we want to keep it going forward. Uh, my next slide, has really no points except that I think it's a cool video. It's not often you see a bobcat uh, come down a tree. So this is in Parkside. Um, obviously you can hear the crows are pretty upset um, with this bobcat. There are actually, there are actually two bobcats. Um, There, there's not many places in the world where you can see a bobcat do that in broad daylight from the villa. So, just really, really neat. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll take questions. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would it be doing up in a tree? They go up in trees quite a bit. Um, they would go up there at night and eat squirrels um, and other things, catch squirrels in their nests. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they're good climbers. I don't think they spend a lot of time in trees, but. That's certainly they do. Uh, we have six with collars right now. Um, we we'll get a we'll get better population estimates um, from Megan's research. Um, our best guess is that we're you know, we were at thirty to thirty five. We probably dropped as low as ten, um, and now we're around twenty to twenty five. So yes, ma'am. What do you think the 
It's a good question. Again, that's something that's going to come out of Megan's research, um, is to basically look at, you know, with this historical data set, we can basically, you know, it, it's a matter of space and cover availability for how many bobcats we can have, right? And, and food resources. And so the hope is that we can look at home range size over time and changes, because certainly we've lost habitat, and so the ideal habitat population probably isn't 30 to 35 anymore. It might be 25 to 30. Um, but we should get we should get a, a pretty good handle on that. Yes, sir. So what happens if it grows to that? Do they naturally, will they just start moving away if it's not habitat? Correct. Are you that goes on? Or? Yeah, so so they, they will certainly leave so so juvenile males in particular um, of, of most of these tend to leave the area in which they were born to go look for new for, for a new place to live. Um, if there is available unoccupied habitat close by, they'll move close by. Um, but a lot of times, you know, at least historically, Kiwi had so many bobcats that all the habitat was utilized. And so those animals, and we looked at some of that, would leave leave Kiwi and go to Seabrook or Downs Island. Um, but we also have cats that are coming from Downs Island and Seabrook to Kiwi as well. So there's there's a good bit of movement back and forth. Um, which is good. Um, so the hope is that you know now that we've reduced this threat, that you know numbers will, will will kind of naturally get back to where they should be, what the habitat can support. And then once they get to the point where where they're you know exceeding that carrying capacity, then you know a number of things happen, right? It gets a little harder for them to find food, so some of them don't make it, maybe. Um, you know, the females are not as not in as good condition, so they don't have as many kittens. And so they kind of regulate their own numbers um, to, you know, to, to occupy the habitat and food resources that are out there. So what's the difference between first and second generation and how it kills the animal? Both are anti-coagulant. Correct. So one, the, the second generation stays in the carcass. For, 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 for a lot longer. They work what the happened, same way. What happens on the first generation? They work the same way. Yeah. Um, ultimately, they prevent the, the target species from clogging their blood and they weak that. Right. Um, but why wouldn't that have the same effect? With the, the Yeah, and so it, it's mainly because, and, and, and we certainly don't <coughs> recommend using first generation and not yeah. like those either. Um, but because they are much, much less toxic, um, it takes, you know, three, four, or five feedings to get a lethal level. Um, that by the time they die, the lethal level is substantially lower than in, than in SGAs. They also break down a lot quicker. Um, those compounds, the first generation compounds, break down within the target animal a lot quicker. So, um, but SGAs can last. But we long. shouldn't use the first generation either. No, nope, not recommended. So what we recommend is either bromethalin or colocalciferol. Um, those are alternative rodenticides that kill just as quickly. Um, they're both single dose um, toxicity, just like the, the SGAs, um, but they don't have the same secondary impacts to the Yes? But if we have the correct population on the island, then we Snakes, birds of prey, bobcats all eat rats and mice. Um, snakes probably do more rodent control than any other species on the planet. Um, so yet another reason not to persecute snakes. Snakes are good. We leave them around. Um, you know, I've got a couple that live in the side of my house, and I'm happy to see them every time. They're keeping their eyes out. Can I ask a different question? Huh? Um, years ago, we had in the backyard. Yeah, you said Robins, American Robins? Yes. 
Yeah, so they're, they're, they're obviously migratory. Um, they show up in, in big flocks. Um, you know, I think they're, I mean, they're, as far as I know, robin numbers are still about what they, what they have been historically. Um, but yeah, because they, because they migrate in big flocks um, and may not be here for an extended period of time, um, yeah, you may just not, it just may be a coincidence thing where you're not, you're just not seeing them when they, when they move through. Um, yeah. I had a gill pond that, you know, the seeds became red mm -hmm. for all at the same time. I've got 200 robin just attacking every little plot in my backyard. Oh, yeah. They moved to your yard. Maybe that's what you're Yes, ma'am. This is a, about another nuisance that we are just beginning to deal with on the Gila and then Sierra Gila. And um, I'm happy to talk about armadillos. <laughs> okay, so armadillos, um, you know, they're, they're obviously native to the U.S. Um, they have they have started moving north in recent years. Um, I think we saw our first armadillo here maybe three, four, five years ago, um, but now we've got a pretty healthy population of armadillos. Um, they can cause some issues. Um, in, in other ways, they're quite beneficial. Um, you know, the, the issues they, they tend to cause are obviously when they're foraging for, for grubs and insects, you know, they make little holes inside and they'll dig in a little bit where they're eating. You know, a lot of times they're eating harmful grubs and insects that can cause issues for, for native plants. Um, but probably the biggest issue they cause is when they, they dig burrows underneath homes, um, steps or foundations. Um, and so those issues do need to be dealt with. Uh, but it's a pretty simple fix to, to exclude the animal or capture the animal and repair the damage. Um, you know, we're never gonna get rid of armadillos. Um, they're gonna be here. But you know, I have not heard of, of, I've heard of very few significant issues from armadillos in the last five years, a handful of them. Um, I've had them in my backyard in West Ashley for 15 years. Um, occasionally they dig under the house and I just fill it in with dirt and concrete and problem solved and move on. Anything else? Yes, you go. Oh. Uh, who are the predators for the for the armadillo? Uh, good question. Uh, bobcats and coyotes, maybe, um, but not a whole lot. You got to flip. You got to flip cars like them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do you have a question? I like to watch birds. I know a lot of people have removed them or been encouraged to remove them because of potentially attracting rats and other residents to, to, to your home. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I, I lean towards it's okay to have bird fears because we enjoy watching birds. And the, you know, obviously the type of seed you use can impact how much gets spilled and the type of feeder that you have can also impact that. You know, in my yard, most of the most of the bird seed that ends up on the ground gets eaten by ground, ground birds as well. Um, but certainly, I've seen rats and mice come to my bird feeders at night. Um, but obviously, if your home is sealed up and you, they're not getting into your house, um, I don't think it's a significant food source. Um, you know, that's going to have a huge impact on your family person. Okay, last. Yep. So. Your opinion at this point, since you know the pledge has been around a couple of years and it's such a transient island, what do you think we can be doing as far as advocacy, word of mouth, talking to our friends, talking to our associate homeowners associations? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's you know, we obviously we, we set up this QA Bobcat Week two years ago and, and we do it every year now. And you know, this year our big push is is just to remind people to Continue to be vigilant, retake the pledge, make sure your neighbors have taken the pledge. Right? We all got on board, you know, after all the traumatic stuff we saw with Bobcats in, in 2020, um, or 2019 and 2020. Um, but we can't forget about that. 
we, we, we have to stay, you know, we have to stay vigilant to this issue or it's going to start to creep back in. Mean, people are going to forget, um, and, and we may have, have issues in there. So just continue to talk about it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great success so far, but it, it's, it's only successful if we continue to talk forward. Well, thank you all. Yeah, thanks very much.